Um, hello and welcome. Thank you very much for joining us for this Philip Brigg conversation with the Rare Books and Special Collections Group. So um, a very warm welcome to Nick Poole, CEO of Philip, and um, Joe Cornish. Thank you very much for joining us and we're um, very interested to see what you want to discuss and, and to, um, to look at your, your plans and um, offer our feedback um, from our perspective. So we'll get on to that in a minute. So um, the schedule for this afternoon really is that um, we'll all introduce ourselves and say hello um, so that we know who's here and what kind of interests we have. Um, and then Nick and Joe will be presenting on recent work and following the consultation with um, on, on, from Philip last year. <clears throat> and then, <clears throat> excuse me, um, invite um, comments and feedback from yourselves. But um, I'm going to hand that bit over, of course, to, to Nick and to Joe to, to lead because you know how you would like to structure all of that. Um, so, um, so first of all, let's just um, have a, a quick whiz around the room, shall we? And, and say who's, who's here and um, what your interest is within um, in the Rare Books and Special Collections group context um, and our relationship with Philip. So I'm just going to go down um, the list of participants as you appear on my screens, um, on my screen. So I think I might start with um, Raffaella. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so very much for organizing this. It's a pleasure to see a few faces. I'm afraid my own camera is not working, so I'm terribly sorry about that. I am very new to the Rebo community. I recently joined the Museum of the Order of St. John, which is uh, a museum, but also has a rare book library of approximately 1,000 to 1,200 rare books and an additional 100 manuscripts. The project was before this, uh, held by Adriana Selma, who unfortunately left um, last year. And I'm just looking forward to hear from everyone today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raffaella. Welcome to your new post. Hope you continue to enjoy it. Um, Katie, Katie Flanagan is next on my, my view. Hi, I'm Katie. I'm the group head of archives and libraries for the Science Museum group. So that's um, five museum sites spread across England. Um, we've got about 20 people, I think, working in our library and archives in a variety of some mixed roles, some archivist, some librarian. Um, I also mentor for SILIP Chartership. Um, and I recently signed up for a fellowship. Um, so I'm quite interested in sort of joining with this. And I am having moments of like, was this a good idea? Um, I'm sure it'll be fine. <laughs> so thank you. Well done, Katie. Thank you. Congratulations and uh, all the best with that, with the fellowship. <laughs> yeah, you can do it. Um, Chris, Chris Barker, would you like to go next? Hi, I work part-time in the old library at Jesus College and part-time in the undergrad library. Um, so just really coming for a catch up. Um, I've been on various CELIP committees in the past, but I've decided now to, to pass it on to uh, younger and fresher faces. So that's me. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Lucy, you're next on my list. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Lucy. I work at the British Library, where I'm curator of 17th and 18th century printer books. Uh, I'm currently the vice chair and conference coordinator of the Rare Books Committee um, and will be taking over as chair when Sarah steps down in the next few weeks. And um, Melanie. I'm Melanie. I look after the Rare Book Collections at Newcastle University Library. Um, I am the outgoing secretary for the Rare Books and Special Collections Group, um, also a select mentor, um, and I'm signed up as a mentor for the HLF as well. Thank you, thank you. Yes, both um, both Lucy, Melanie, and I are are about to um, change our roles or or leave our roles. So um, uh, on the committee as we transition into the new um, committee structure. So oh, membership really. So thank you to both of you. <laughs> so great. Um, now over to our hosts or our guests, I should say, um, Nick and Joe, and maybe you would like to introduce yourselves to to us as well, and then I'll leave it with you to carry on, I think, unless you want me to do anything uh, anything else at the moment. 
Shall, shall I say hello, Joe, and then hand off to you? Brilliant. Um, so hello, everybody. I'm, I'm Nick Poole. I'm Chief Executive here at SILIP, uh, a great and avid lover of rare and antiquarian books, having spent a very happy period of my life working for Foils Bookshop, looking after some of their antiquarian collections. So um, really, really lovely to see you all and, and great to be here and looking forward to talking about our, our plans for the future. Joe. So I'm Joe Cornish and I'm Chief Development Officer for SILIP. I'd just like to say I can strongly endorse what Nick's just said. He doesn't just say that to every group, by the way. He really, really, really loves special books, special collections and rare books. So, um, yeah, so my role at SILIP. So I work closely alongside Nick as sort of taking the ambition and strategic direction of SILIP and translating that into deliverables, translating that into action for the membership. Uh, and my background is public libraries, so I worked in public libraries before I came to SILIP, uh, but whilst I've been at SILIP, my focus has really been on stakeholder relationships, building strategic relationships across and beyond the sector, and a lot of work on professional standards, qualifications, um, accreditations, those sorts of things, so um, that's what I've been, been busy doing for the last few years. Um, shall I carry on, Nick, if you don't mind? sharing the slides, then um, I shall launch into the presentation if that's okay. Here we go. Thank you. Great, okay. So obviously here we are today. Thank you so much for having us. We really appreciate it. I was just saying this is my first big conversation of the year. So first one back on the road and we've got a new slide deck. So I'm really pleased to be introducing this to yourselves, but really this is a conversation and what's most important is that we hear your voices. So Nick and I will move through the presentation at a fairly rapid pace because we want to give as much time to discussion as we possibly can. So what we're going to cover is, um, uh, Sarah brilliantly has covered that introduction piece for us. So we have gone round the room and, and got to know each other a little. What we're going to look at is uh, the We Are SILIP uh, five year strategy and action plan. So Nick will take us through the piece of work that we've been working hard to develop. Um, and you're getting a sneak preview. Actually, this is the first time we've shared this outside of the board. So. And then I'm going to run us through a bit of a SILIP update. So an update on, on membership, uh, the membership proposition and what we've been doing regarding professional services and standards, particularly the professional knowledge and skills base. And then we'll move on to that conversation piece, which is where we will have a facilitated discussion uh, just to gather your ideas and thoughts on, on what we've presented and, and anything else that you, you want to share with us. That would be lovely. So I think probably, if we just have the next slide, Nick, but I think we've probably, yeah, you're gonna go, go straight through to the next section. I will hand off to you. Fantastic, thank you, Joe, brilliant. And yes, this is not technically launching until the 9th of February. Uh, so we're really excited. It's been the product of about a year and a half's work, um, been doing sort of big conversations, meeting members, talking to stakeholders, trying to get a sense of, you know, what are people's expectations? What, what are we doing well at the moment that people want us to carry on? doing where are the areas we need to build and, and develop um, and so very pleased to present to you we are SILIP which is going to be the five-year action plan and, and strategy for our community uh, over the next five years with a strapline of information knowledge and libraries changing lives together so what I thought we'd do is just run through the main ideas that have come through in this five-year plan and, and the sort of new direction I think it takes us in as a, a professional community. Uh, we are going to be fully bilingual at launch, um, so there's a Welsh language version uh, of all of the information and the strategy that's going to go live on the 9th as well, and then um, promoting We Are Silip. Uh, across uh, all of our channels and platforms starting from the 9th but really going on for the next uh, few months so I really hope after today well actually after today you won't tell anyone but from the 9th of February I hope uh, you'll join us in sharing uh, some of the messages and I just to pause on why we are SILIP really um, a lot of the conversations we've had over the last year are, are kind of SILIP should conversations you know SILIP should be doing this in our, our sector. And our, our response is, well, we're all SILIP. You know, we have a professional staff, we have a brilliant community, a, a network of networks, we have a really strong board, uh, we have representation and, and national committees in Scotland, Wales and, and Northern Ireland. And so it's all of us. And so really what we want to do is agree together what the priorities are and then how we use this platform uh, to make a positive difference for the profession. So the 
core idea here, I think, is, is one of unity. Um, the idea is that we're here for absolutely everyone who has a professional connection to libraries, information, knowledge, and data. It was really interesting. With Joe and I've just come from a call with a colleague in the NHS uh, who wanted to know about our professional community, and, and I think she came away a bit stunned, really, by the range of skills uh, that librarians and information professionals are bringing uh, to the context in which people are working. So the purpose uh, for the organization is going to be to unite, support and empower in prof information professionals in all sectors. Uh, we want to be a professional community and, and that word professional uh, is I think still really central to our, our purpose. Uh, we want to be a really good membership body. So we want to add value for our members and we want to attract new members into this community. But from all of the conversations we've been having that there's a really strong theme emerging around doing this for, for a purpose, you know, that, that we have a very clear sense of social justice. Some of the issues going on in the US at the moment, highlighting the issues around intellectual freedom, censorship, the role that we play, um, not just in passively providing access to collections, but actively creating the conditions for people to engage with ideas. Uh, and then a very clear focus on evidence-based practice that, you know, Lord knows there's enough abuses of information going on out there. We, we have not to contribute to that. Um, but all of this builds on the charter, which was you know, established in 1898, uh, updated more recently, um, but really promotes the idea that we are here to serve the public, that, that fundamentally SILIP is a public benefit uh, community and organization, and that we do that by advancing librarianship and information science and ensuring provision of services uh, for everybody that needs to use them. So we went around, uh, as I say, talking to members about what the, the four big preoccupations are, the, the kind of big contexts uh, within which we're working, and they are these four. So a very clear focus uh, and a role for information professionals in sustainability, um, but not just in a, a sort of environment and recycling sense, although that is really important, but really in a sort of informed and accountable use of resources sense, a, a kind of continuity and preservation of the materials in our stewardship and care. Um, so sustained access to knowledge, sustainable services and accountable use of resources um, comes through really, really strongly from uh, the responses we've had so far from members. Digital transformation happening absolutely everywhere. And I think uh, there's a view emerging that there's a sort of good digital world and a bad digital world, and we want to try and achieve the good digital world. So unlocking the potential of technology, but not making sort of short term arbitrary decisions, not putting things at risk and, and particularly not undermining the corpus of, of knowledge uh, purely in the sake of getting it digitized. So some key roles, I think, for us in, in terms of driving good digital transformation uh, through our skills and ethics. Very strong focus on equity and social justice. Um, so being accountable and, and holding ourselves to account in our own practice for making a positive difference and then the impact that that has on the wider world. Um, again, we're in a very polarized age. And I think the, the ability of information professionals to help navigate that through trust and transparency and accountability uh, in the decisions we make with and, and for people is going to be really, really important. And then the final one, which sort of unifies all of the others really is leadership. And this central idea that we've got to move from being information managers to information leaders that we have in, in the words of one of our trustees to sort of step out from behind the curtain really, because I, I think our professional skills and competencies have been devalued. We, we all know that. And equally, we all know that change driven by an informed ethical information professional is more likely to be sustainable and effective and, and meaningful. Um, so not leadership for its own sake, but leadership because we can make a fundamental difference to change in our institutions and our, our communities. And, and so I think really we want to proclaim to the world that our job isn't just uh, back office support, it's leading uh, positive change for our, for our users and our organizations. 
So we then we've been talking a lot about what should we do as a professional body? What, what do people expect of us? Um, and I'm very keen never again in my life to have to say the word SILIP is not a union. So we thought it would be really useful to set out exactly what it is that we do do. And, and it's encapsulated in these four things. Um, so we're the only organization in the world that operates under Royal Charter to recognize the skills and competencies of librarians, information and, and knowledge professionals. Um, I think the key thing we need to do is make sure that that recognition is valued in a marketplace for skills and that employers are recognizing and understanding why they need to invest in professionalism and professional development. Expertise, uh, which combines, I think, skills, um, but also professional standards uh, and really focuses on celebrating the expertise of our members uh, and the impact that that has on, uh, you know, the jobs you're doing, the communities that you're serving. We also then want to really strengthen our, our role as a representative, as an advocate. Uh, we are the leading independent representative voice. There are lots of sector organizations, but we are the biggest cross-sector um, independent voice. Uh, so we want to continue to increase the visibility of our profession. You know, yes, with national decision makers, although the return on that investment is diminishing at the moment, but particularly with employers. Um, so that employers in, in different sectors understand the value of, of the people that they have at their disposal. And then finally, community. We, we are and are proud to be the largest and most diverse cross-sector information community outside the US and China. So it's really only the, the American Library Association and, and the Chinese uh, group of associations that are bigger uh, than our community. And I think what we really want to be doing is unlocking uh, the hive mind across that, you know, tapping into the knowledge and expertise that flows across that whole community. So we've got a strong platform. We belong to our members. We're making a difference. I think what we want to do is, is build on that over the next five years. Um, so one of the things we've been looking at, which is a sort of hidden work of SILIP that I think we really need to bring to the fore, is that over the last five years, we've really been able to build a position of influence with key stakeholders who are able to make decisions to support information professionals. Um, so we're well networked within the media now and, and pushing regular messaging and briefing through them, but also working with regulators, for example, around the use of information and, and disinformation. Um, we're well embedded in, in policy through think tanks, local and, and central government and the devolved administration. So, you know, for example, the government response to the Danny Kruger report uh, for the first time in, in recent years, uh, promotes libraries employing paid professional qualified staff. Um, and so, you know, we need to keep banging that drum across all of those platforms. Working a lot with industry, uh, building our relationships across lists. I think one of the permanent benefits of, um, not benefits, of the positive outcomes of, uh, you know, the disruption of the last couple of years is that organisations are now much better prepared to work together um, and I think that's evidenced in the heritage collections work I'll, I'll mention in a moment. Working well across education, increasingly embedded with school leadership, governors, further education, the prison community, and also within the charity sector. And, and so sometimes I think our members don't necessarily see all of this, but one of the things that um, we're doing a lot of is getting out there and banging the drum for our professional skills. So to bring all of that together on, on a page, um, we know who our audience are, and, and I think, you know, we have really moved on from the days when this was a protectorate just for one kind of professional. Uh, I think we're a very inclusive professional body for people who have a professional connection to libraries, information, knowledge and data, and, and who believe that those things make a positive difference in the world. Um, those four strategic contexts, I think, are going to guide a lot of the work, sort of evidence-based sustainability and continuity of access to knowledge digital transformation, equity and social justice and, and leadership. Um, we have a strong sense of our identity and our purpose as set out in, in the charter. Um, we're going to be providing recognition, some of the services Joe will, will mention in a moment, um, celebrating expertise of our members, um, providing representation and advocacy and, and celebrating and strengthening the brilliant work that you and other you know, special interest groups, member networks across SILIP are doing. And then there's some work we need to do internally as well. You know, our, our IT is not where it should be for an information professional body. We have our own green policy to develop. Um, we want to do more to unlock knowledge. 
so we're doing those things at the moment to, to sort of put our house in order. So what we are doing is asking members to support us in getting the message out uh, from the 9th of February. Um, so we're asking people if you've got just a minute or less uh, to share the strategy uh, with the hashtag we are Silip. Um, we're also asking people, we're, we're developing a poster for people to put up in their library or their staff room, um, which explains how you can get the most out of your Silip membership, basically, um, but also a little bit of why you should join. Um, we have developed an ideas platform, I'll, I'll show you at the end uh, of this, uh, after we've, we've had a chance to speak. Uh, we are developing a video montage, so if you're inspired to appear on video and talk a little bit about what you do, then we would love to showcase uh, somebody from the RSRVSCG community. Um, we'd love people to get together and talk about the contexts and what they mean in the context of your work. Um, and more than that, we'd like to get more people involved in, in sort of working with us on what we're doing. So I just, before I hand over to Joe, I just wanted to take a moment really, because a lot of this is thanks to Sarah in particular, but I know, I know other colleagues across the community. This is a really important community, not, not just for me, although it is, but you know, for SILIP more generally. Um, continuity of access to knowledge and, and preservation are really core and fundamental principles. Um, Sarah's been amazing actually in, in helping us to engage with a lot of this and to sort of think through the implications. And I think the work we've been doing together to shape the Heritage Collections Advisory Group is really, really important. So I, I don't know if everybody would have seen that. Um, the website's gone live with the statement of principles and we're working with, you know, YAML UK, um, British Library involved, um, RL UK and Scholar sort of observers on it, a number of other bodies collectively to make the case for access to you know specialist collections uh, and expertise and research um, and so i think that is a really key and positive collective step we've been able to take together with um with you and with your support some of the things uh, we've been doing already you know i'm not going to claim that we were the thing that triggered the difference but actually um you know in in the vna we did get actively involved through the group and um, you know, ultimately there is now a, a better outcome, not, a, not, not the outcome quite we wanted, but a better outcome. Similarly, we engaged with Wallace and had some conversations there. And again, you know, the outcome wasn't as bad as it could have been, still not ideal. Um, National Museum of Wales, obviously engaging with them over their proposed changes. Um, we worked with Richard Ovenden at the Bodleian to develop the statement uh, in defense of librarians and archivists at risk in, in Afghanistan. More recently, we've been speaking, uh, I've been speaking on behalf of the group with uh, Stoke Council about the loss of curatorial expertise at the Potteries and, and Gladstone Museum. The Joint Statement of Principles, which, um, you know, was a great piece of work from Sarah and, and Jane Bramwell, um, really sets out a positive position around why we must defend the principle of knowledge collections and, and research. Uh, and I think what we have now is a really valuable early warning network, so a sort of protocol for flagging issues um, and making positive interventions. So I, I think it's one of the things I'm, I'm most proud of really in the last year and a half is, is all of us coming together to provide that line of defence and positive line of advocacy for uh, those resources. So, Joe, should I pause and take any questions or should I hand straight on? What, what would you rather? Shall we pause there just to take any questions on that? Just okay. It's yeah. talking up a bit, doesn't it? Absolutely. Uh, so just scanning through the chat. Oh, tell you what, I'm going to stop sharing for a moment so I can see you all. Would, would anybody like to comment or question or, or sort of follow up on anything? Well, I'd, I'd just like to say thank you very much for um, uh, you know talking talking us through all of that. That that was a brilliant introduction to um, to the work that you've been doing, and it's great to see it all coming together into the points that you that you've mentioned. Um, and thank you for mentioning the the heritage um, collections group that that we've been working on as well. And I'm I'm glad it's having such an impact um, and is there to go forward. It seems to me to speak directly to the sustained access to resources line that that you mentioned in your presentation as well, Nick, you know, sustained in terms of long-term sustainability, um, long-term access to people, people's skills and the resources. So thank you for your comments. Beautiful. No, not, not at all. And one thing I forgot to mention is we're celebrating our 125th year of our charter in, in next year, in 2023. Um, and so we are an organisation that cares, I think, quite deeply about the long now. 
and the long term. And, and I think one of the issues is we're living in quite a short term age. So it, it is good, I think, to be making a stand for um, the long term continuity of access to knowledge. You know. Any other comments from people? There was something about Gaelic language resources I, I spotted. Uh -huh. Uh, that, that was just in response to the fact that um, you said this would be fully bilingual in Welsh and having just come from Cardiff University last year and to the University of Edinburgh this year uh, and being one of the, the thousands of people who signed up for the, the Scottish Gaelic Duolingo module when it premiered during lockdown. Um, I was just curious whether there was any appetite for Gaelic language resources uh, or you know representation within SILIP of the other languages of the UK. It hasn't translated through yet, has it, Nick? I would say. I mean, we, we would we would take our cue from Silip in Scotland, really, on, on that front. But I mean, I think it could be following the wave of. Do you, do you see what I mean? I think this could be. You may be the first of those inquiries, um, and more will follow. Yeah. No, it, it hasn't come up before, and it's a really interesting question. And I, I mean, you know, to an extent. One of the things we're trying to do with We Are Silip is say, well, let's let's sort of share that idea with the community, see if there's anybody able and willing to help and, and get together and support what that would look like. It's taken us a bit of time, longer than it should, to be honest, to get our Welsh language policy together, which was a ultimately came down to a practical question of who's in a position to translate technical librarianship into well into Welsh. Um, so it'd be really interesting to have that conversation about Scots Gaelic, but uh, we can. What we certainly can do is is take it back, feed it in, um, have a chat with Sean at Silip in Scotland about it as well, and then just see whether there's a line of action on it. So can we can we feed it into the overall development? Lovely. Yeah, uh, having had to produce bilingual materials for Cardiff University, I can certainly appreciate the struggle. <laughs> We have found somebody really good now, but uh, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Birthday cake. Yes. Oh, yeah, we're going to be ambushed by cake next year. Uh, no, and, uh, I, we are looking at how we, we celebrate. And um, one of the things, we, in, when we hit 100, we struck a centenary medal and used it to celebrate the, the sort of new generation of librarianship coming through. Um, 25 years ago and we were thinking either about revisiting those librarians 25 years later and seeing what they're all up to which you know may or may not work uh, or doing a similar thing this time around and, and looking at the the generation 125 and seeing what they're up to but uh, yeah so any ideas on how we can celebrate be most welcome brilliant joe shall i shall i hand back to you in that case and, and bring the slides up yeah Thank you. Great. OK, so I, what I'm going to do, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the key developments that we wanted to share with you. Obviously, we've got limited time today. So I'm going to start with a, uh, if we could go on one slide, Nick, um, talk to you about SILIP membership and what it means to us, what it means to us centrally and what we, what the, the call to action really, the help that we need from our communities. So one of the things that we want to do in that position as being the independent voice, independent voice for the profession is to make sure that we're truly representative. And to be truly representative, we want to grow our community. The bigger our community, the more that we have that mandate to speak with authority uh, for what the community wants and needs. And we know that one of the biggest drivers around membership is peer review. So what we're really looking at, and it's under this principle of we are SILIP as well, is that sense of if SILIP is useful to you, if it's something you're finding value from, is helping us share that message so that we can grow our professional community. Because the, the bigger we are, the more membership we have, the louder the voice we have, and the more we can influence it and have power. So I, it's just that piece around encouraging you to think about where you might have opportunities to, you know, sort of share value that you're, that you're taking from your select membership and encourage others to, to step towards us as well. And if we go on to the next slide, one of the things we've been working on is a much clearer articulation of our benefits. Um, SILIP has uh, a variety of benefits and values to our members, and we know that. 
um, and some engage more with some elements than others. And sometimes um, it's, it's a really wide spectrum, which is a lovely problem to have, except it's quite hard for people to articulate. Or, and it's hard for the members or the potential members to even drill down into, you know, what is, is, is this for me? What, you know, what value might I draw from this membership? So what we've done is we've, we've worked hard to distill down into 10 points, the key membership benefits of SILIP. And this will form the basis of the poster that Nick referenced in his sort of call to action uh, at the end of We Are SILIP. So these are the things that we think are really bringing value. So we obviously would welcome your, your comments or thoughts about whether we've, we've achieved that. But you can see that from that list, there's a wide variety. We provide career support, helping people map and develop their careers. We have professional registration, which gives that international badge of recognition of the, the standard of, uh, of quality of, uh, of practice from our professionals. We have, as you well know, enormous community of committed uh, experts uh, who are welcoming and open and, and driving forward change and innovation. And those examples that Nick was just sharing about the, the work with this group and in this area, they just they're, they're astounding and you should be proud and we're very proud and that that value that you're creating is quite remarkable. We also um, offer you training in CPD. Nick's already talked about that idea of advocacy and that, that web of influence that we're building on your behalf. You know, even if it's in the background, you know, the, 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 the idea is that we would all benefit from that. We're a really great way to key into thought leadership and insight and update. You have a really incredible um, driver for um, information through Information Professional Magazine, through our groups and through um, our facet publications as well. We also offer a variety of financial support mechanisms for our members. There's bursaries and grants and also the um, uh, benevolent fund for, for our, our members as well. There's legal expert advice that's available to our members. So um, it, it offers advice on a variety of topics and that includes employment law. So that is a way that you can have that benefit and tap into it. One of the things that, again, particularly through in, in your membership of our, our special interest groups and our member networks is that opportunity to have experiences or grow experiences outside of the day job and committees and, and engaging with your group is a brilliant way to do that. It allows you to create a parallel space to develop skills that you're really interested in if that opportunity isn't necessarily within your current role. It also gives you that amazing peer network outside of your immediate organisation for when things are hard or when you want to test ideas and um, finding some who's done it or someone who can advise you it's a really uh, friendly voice a uh, friendly and informed voice to support your career and a huge variety a tableau of um, discounts and offers for, for our select members including on facet publications and on our events and a variety of others as well so the idea is that we want this sort of clear simple proposition um, which captures the, the breadth of that value um, and we, we hope that that will help our engaged members our enthusiastic members to um, share that those principles with their colleagues too okay so if we move on to the next slide i'm going to talk Bit about the professional knowledge and skills base now the PKSB this was a, a big piece of work for us uh, in the last year so I keep saying to this Nick time's a bit elastic for me now and I keep losing track of which year was which but what we did um, was revise the PKSB um, it's really important with skills standards that they are updated to reflect uh, the current position of the profession and also to identify and start tracing the future skills for the profession to, to help our, um, our profession build those skills that will give them long and interesting careers. So the PKSB um, solid piece of work and that those ethical principles and values that sit at the middle, the heart of our profession, they, those endure, they, they don't change, but the skills we need to deliver our services do change. So we did a big piece of work to update the PKSB. Now, the PKSB is really fundamental to us. It really matters um, because it sits at the center of a really important ecosystem for the wider community, the profession and the SILIP community, to be honest. So it sits in that space um, where it acts as, as um, the center for learning provision because qualifications are accredited against it, the apprenticeship is mapped to it, professional registration runs from it, so it creates that sense of um, um, 
equivalence um, and quality assurance around the learning that's being given to our that is available to our professionals. It's really important to our employers as it helps them map the skills they've got within their own teams. It helps them look for uh, potential developments, how they might, might want to alter roles or recruit into roles or reshape their teams to make sure that they're harnessing the value. And obviously really important for our individual members as well, because it allows you to really um, concentrate on the skills you want to develop for the role you're in now, or potentially the roles you want to move into. And the PKSB is designed to be used by the individual, you know, so it's, it's, uh, it's a tool that, that works for the entire profession. So it gives you that transferability, you can track your skills across the profession, but it also gives the level of depth to allow you as, um, as professionals to identify areas you want to develop for yourselves. So it's a really important piece of work for us. We also have lots of external um, frameworks and professions that want to align to the PKSB. And again, SILIP's work is to make sure that we're creating a frictionless movement as frictionless movement as possible for you so that your skills align uh, and translate into the qualifications and um, other professional awards so you can sort of have the recognition that you you deserve if we move on one slide please nick in doing that piece of um revision it was we employed a a brilliant cross-sector working group to help us do that piece. Um, it was represented with different nations, different groups, um, different disciplines, um, different sectors represented on that group. And what they did was an extensive piece of work to uh, review the PKSB as it was. So we strengthened the areas that needed to be strengthened. We added, we improved, um, we removed a couple of items. There's a couple of items that came out as well. Um, and then the next thing we did was we widely consulted and tested. So we consulted on the draft to check that we had hit the mark. And it's been really well received. It's been out in the wild now for, for some time and it's been really well received. And it's um, when we're aligning to other bits of workforce development pieces, all the ideas that our partner organizations are flagging as important are the ideas that we've developed within the PKSB. So we're feeling that it's being sort of um, road tested well. And if we go on one more, please, Nick. So the other thing I wanted to talk about with regards to the PKSB was the revision of the online tool as well. So this is, whilst the PKSB itself, that knowledge acts as a, as a, a framework for all sorts of activities, as I said, qualifications, accreditation, professional registration. What we also provide for you as individual members is access to this online tool. And that's actually pretty unique within a professional association to have a, a tool of this with this much depth and functionality. Uh, and it is a, a benefit that is a solely a member benefit, the access to the online tool. And what it allows you to do is really engage with the PKSB in a really interactive way that you can tailor to your own needs. The PKSB, because it covers the whole profession, we never recommend that everyone does every part of it. It is designed that you choose the parts that are most relevant to you or most relevant to where you want to get to. So it, it allows you to dip in and out of the sections that work best for you. And it allows you to consider where you are now, where you would like to be, um, where you started from. So you can map your progression. And from that, you can then also create reports and heat maps, which will help you guide your career development or your CPD, um, because it can show you where you're really strong. So you can articulate those strengths in appraisals or articulate those strengths in job interviews, or it can show you where you've got areas you want to develop to help you target or argue for your CPD and training. So it can be a really useful tool to you. Uh, and that reporting function, I think, is really good. We've also increased um, the accessibility within that functionality. So we've made it um, a much more user friendly tool for our community as well. So we're really pleased with it. We're encouraging people to get involved with it. Um, and as I said, the, the ambition is for this to be a live piece. Skill standards should develop. So we will want to um, continue to keep that conversation alive with our community to make sure that we can make those adaptions and updates where we can. And then I think moving on probably to, I think it's my last slide is the, is the next one. Yeah, just a quick run through of some of the projects. How are we doing for time? Okay, I'll be, I will be brief with these. Obviously we can supply more information on these if you want, and there's information available to you. Um, but we're looking after a, a really wide portfolio of funded projects. Um, and obviously always looking out for good ideas as well. But just to pick out some here, the Green Libraries Initiative is one that's really tapping into that sustainability goal that um, we were talking about within the five-year plan. 
and that's a, a joint partnership, ACE uh, Arts Council funded and in partnership with, with Libraries Connected and others. The Media and Information Literacy Alliance is a, a really exciting new um, alliance that's grown up that's uh, bringing together all the strands of people who care about uh, making uh, the online space safer uh, and uh, creating a happier, happier, healthier society because of it. Uh, and then I won't read them all out, but the, the one that Nick and I was, were particularly talking about yesterday was um, the policy on intellectual freedom and, and, and censorship, uh, which is a really exciting and interesting piece of work that's being worked up by a, a policy committee. And I'm really looking forward to seeing the release of that for consultation in March. I think it is a piece of um, engaged and ethical thinking for our profession. And I think it will be an important piece for us as we move forward and, and are put in testing ethical situations, something for us to, to have in our back pocket. So I, I probably will, so if obviously if any in the chat, anyone wants us to give any more detail on any of those projects, then say, and we will, but I will stop there. So we've got time to, to hear from you. I'll hand back to you, Nick. Would really help if I unmuted, wouldn't it? There you go. Thank you very much, Joe. That's fantastic. Yeah, and a, a really sort of quick run through a huge amount of work, but I, th I think it is exciting. I, I think as a profession, we've really found our, our identity and our role and and you know arguably a place during the pandemic in terms of adding value to communities i think the key thing for this next five years is consolidating on that and building out uh employer recognition and support so that people get paid properly and um you know uh, working under proper terms and conditions and that the value of our profession is recognized um but a lot in there a lot of ambitions a lot of uh, thinking but we really wanted to understand a little bit more from you I think specifically in terms of the institutions you support, the collections you work with, um, you know, what, what's on the horizon over the next five years that we should be aware of, um, what's worrying you, and, um, you know, what would you like us to, to look at doing together, where, where might we go? So I'm going to stop sharing with those, those three questions, but essentially, what, what are you really excited about? Uh, what concerns are, are on your mind and, and what would you like to see us doing together? So hopefully, if I come back to everybody, uh, people will have thoughts on, on or, or any questions for Joe as well, obviously. But uh, does anybody have anything they'd like to share? What's really exciting in your workplace at the moment? Is everybody, is everybody back in a workplace or are most people working from home? It's both. Both. How's it going? Um, it's it's interesting. Um, the blended working approach, I think, is here to stay in my organisation. Um, but we're still working with reduced capacity in the office at any time. So everything you do is still a more protracted process. Yeah, I, I think we've really thinking, haven't we? Because I think everything was reactive in the beginning, the big digital pivot and the shift online into home working. And I don't know if it's anything like the conversations we're having, people are just starting to figure out what a next new normal is going to look like and what the expectations are. So we've got a comment in the chat back in the workplace, uh, arrived after the lockdowns, I have yet to have a work from home day. Ah, okay. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. We've got colleagues that have, have joined Silip. Actually, we've got one colleague who joined Silip and left during the lockdown, who I never met in person, but sort of worked with on a daily basis. It's, um, oh, I thought, you, I thought you meant a member. I was horrified, Nick. You mean no, a member no, no, of staff, no. <laughs> which isn't, no. you know, they went on to good opportunity. Sorry, I thought you meant a member yeah, joined no. another. That's terrible. <laughs> okay, no, no. I think, Katie, you wanted to come in? Thank you. Yeah, I was just going to say, we've all been assigned to different roles depending on our level of job um so my role is designated as connector um which means it's strategic so i am 80 percent work from home although it's quite flexible um i haven't actually been on site for eight weeks <laughs> and i've only been in the job for three months um but i in theory go on site once a week but because i travel across the country to the other sites um i it, it really varies across a month but it sort of averages out Really, but I do spend an awful lot of time staring at teams, I must admit. Um, I am quite interested in your um, sustainability and library strand because we've got a big objective for the whole of the Science Museum group around sustainability. Um, so I'm, I know you've only just started it as well, um, but I've been, I'll be following that one with interest. One of the big things for, certainly for us in the library and archive bit is um, we currently have a policy where people have to wear gloves to handle everything, the um, nitrile gloves, 
not not the cotton ones it's all right um and that's from our conservation department basically to protect the people from the stuff and the other way around um but obviously that's got a massive sustainability implication even though we have got glove recycling at each site um so that's something that we're looking at um along with sort of wider things across each site around um you know energy efficiency and all that kind of thing um so yeah i'm looking forward to hearing about that one it sounds you found i mean it sounds spot on for what we're we're looking at that there is a grants program under that so we, we've been funded to run a grant program on green library so i think that will be going live around about april may so it'd be worth looking out for there but um yeah it, it's been really interesting thinking our way into this one because I, I think we started actually talking to you know people who do sustainability for universities and you know a lot of big local authorities have policies um and they were saying that they, they're sort of moving on from if you like sort of performative sustainability you know things you can be seen to be doing that make you feel good but don't necessarily uh, actually make a net contribution to, to how sustainable you are to understanding sustainability is a sort of emerging property of complex systems and and the thing is really using data to work out what really works rather than what you think should work um, and i think there's a really central role for libraries in in that the sort of evidence-based sustainability practice i think that the other areas we're looking at are you know very clearly greening spaces in the supply chain so you know what what are uh, ideas around um bookstock paper supply um you know the, the conversations about ruggedizing paperbacks which is quite an interesting one instead of uh you know using plastic on on the covers and then particularly in light of covid you, you know changing rules around airflow and heating ventilation and air control and what the impact of those is on the the environmental sustainability of the building um, so I think that the, the good thing about this one as well is it's a three year program. So we're going to do some investigative pilot projects this year and then look to build that grant program next year of saying, OK, we've, we've got a better idea of what works. So we know what we want to invest in. Um, so, yeah, would would love to talk to you more about what people are doing already, because it, it's like we recently did a project on international work and we started it with a, a sort of survey landscape review and um, discovered libraries are already doing a huge amount of international work just in a million different ways and I suspect it's going to be the same with the green agenda I think most libraries are doing work already um, so we want to sort of capture what people are doing now um, so there is I think it's the hub page for that live I, if it's not now it will be in the next couple of days but it'll just be silip.org.uk slash green libraries um, and we've got information about the program going up on on there Uh, Sarah. Thank you. Easier to stick up a, a real hand. Um, <laughs> that's um, interesting um, to me too, because in the next five years, we're supposed to be moving to a new building. So, um, and, and whilst this has been under discussion for at least the last 10 years, it does appear to be starting soon. So um, it's been announced that um, the new building construction will begin in October 2022. And it's all part of the London Borough of Southwark's regeneration programme. So I think it is going to start now. <laughs> um, so um, we'll be um, looking in rather more detail at um, what our requirements will be for, um, for both our library spaces um, and our archive spaces. So, you know, that, that sort of green work will translate across, across that sort of semi-divide of professions, I suppose. But, um, you know, what, what we'll want in a more um, digital orientated library space where, you know, a learning zone type of space where, where students want to be present, but they want a lot of um, digital and technical facilities um, uh, and um, how we, manage the traditional stock um in, in you know sort of space that isn't really any bigger but you know so so rolling stacks and floor loading and all the sort of the usual stuff um and then also how we will um maintain the controlled environments for our closed collections and, and our archives and special collections um and at the moment we have plant that we you know that was put in 15 or so years ago and and it would be great to it, you know when it's my my aspiration my hope that we'll be able to move forward in a way that isn't um so reliant upon energy you know and that we can do it in a much more sustainable way so um i know 
there's been quite a lot of work in the sector on on that um so i'm i'm keen to sort of gather together as much of that research as i can find and hopefully influence the discussions around that within the building design as it goes through its reba stages so um yeah i'll be keen to have a look at that as well thank you amazing we um we found ourselves doing a, a briefing for the telegraph of all things on green libraries uh, at the end of, of last week and one of the projects we shared with them was a, a, a library which I think is in Edinburgh um, where they'd moved to a new building and reduced energy by 65% um, so I need to dig out the details of which library it was but it, it was a fantastic bit of thoughtful design but, but it also raises a really interesting uh, debate for me which um, around physicality and conservation you know the, there's a lot of interesting dialogue around um, use and I'm really interested in the way the conservation community have talked about um, you know conservation and use being two sides of the same coin um, and you know there, there was a beautiful I don't know if everybody saw it, it was a wonderful tweet of a, an antiquarian book that had sadly got water damaged and had swollen to the point where it looked like a regency collar it was kind of going around on, on Twitter a couple of days ago and somebody said just best of luck trying to digitize this um, you know <laughs> to re restate the case for physicality um, but also you know fascinated that some of the things that are going on with heating ventilation air control and building design where you've got sort of passive uh, systems which have negative airflow outwards or kind of negative pressure outwards so you're keeping pollutants out and away from the collections by design rather than by engineering um, so I think there's some really exciting frontiers to explore I just as, as you know Sarah we're we're a bit worried about you know, digitization will solve all, all space constraints. And I, th I think we have to be really clear that there is a tremendous role for digitization as part of the toolkit, but it's not a replacement for uh, physical engagement. I think, uh, Raphael, I think you wanted to come in on this one. I'm terribly sorry to move away from buildings and sustainability, but I had some questions and maybe requests from, uh, for advice regarding sort of outreach and sharing information. Um, mm. A huge part of a museum work is actually to share the history of the order and the general history of Crusades, Knights of Malta and all this. So there's a lot of work going on with children, amongst others, schools, uh, visits, tours. And ideally, the library will eventually feed into this. Right now, the collection is not fully catalogued, so it's difficult for it to happen. Right. But the more I work through it, the more I think that the metadata that we add, that is a very professional skill that we've all learned i think can be a little difficult for outsiders to read and my role here will likely end later this year which means that the collection catalog will be in the hand of the museum staff i was wondering if anyone had advice on to how to ensure that this collection this catalog in the long term can be understood by people that are essentially coming from outside the profession and also to ensure that it's usable for school resources, for example. We we have a lot of been in central London. So, we can reach out to quite a lot of people, but it does bring up these questions. So if anyone has advice, um, please, please do I, communicate. I defer, defer to the experts in the room on, on this one, but um, uh, fascinating uh, project. I think it was at the Wallace Collection a few years ago now where they, digitized uh, generations of the catalog or, or the documentary record so that you could scroll back and forth and see quite how different different generations interpretation of cataloging was um, and you know that cataloging very much as a creative art rather than a, a, a canonical science um, so I, I'm fascinated does anybody have an answer to that when you've moved on how do you make sure your cataloging is comprehensible to whoever comes next are we going to, presumably using standards and taxonomies, but uh, has anybody cracked that one? No, it's a really interesting question. Um, I mean, what I do know, which is a slightly uh, weaselly answer, is we have a fantastic metadata and discovery group within SILIP who almost certainly would have an answer to part of that question, but uh, uh, I haven't got your name, Tracy. Sorry, uh, Christine, by the way. Christine, Christine McGowan, day events organizer for RBSCG, oh, rare books cataloger turned project manager. Uh, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I don't think we have quite cracked the answer uh, for how to ensure that our catalogs remain accessible to all, but I just wanted to chime in with the fact that 
in the rare books world, we are sort of confronted with these conflicting needs to serve both the, the general public and to get them interested and get them in the door and entice them to use our collections, but also to serve the highly specialist user who wants to see all of the highly technical jargon. You know, they're investigating a particular binding structure that is unique to, you know, 16th century Greece or something. And we need to be able to accommodate both ends of that research spectrum without alienating the other. Um, and uh, yes, this is definitely something that comes up in the metadata group discussions a lot, uh, particularly with regard to our search interfaces and, and you know, the single search box versus the, the advanced search and, and how we serve these conflicting communities or, or you know, diverse communities, not necessarily conflicting. Yeah, I, I worked on a project called Proud Heritage about 10 years ago, which is about retrospectively documenting LGBTQ material in historic collections. Mm -hmm. And there's no way to do it without applying a contemporary filter and applying words today that wouldn't have been recognized by the people at the time. And, and so there's there's always some degree of trade off with it, isn't there? But, um, so Raphael, I'm sorry, it's a bit of a bit, bit of an incomplete answer, but there's definitely someone in the SILIC community who will know the answer to that. So uh, I can share it across to the metadata and discovery group and see if they can come up with anything as well. Good. I realize suddenly we're sort of at the top of time. So I might just share a couple of um, final thoughts as well. So I'm just gonna bring the last slide uh, back up here. Um, Assuming it shows, there we go. Uh, yes, so uh, this thing has proven to be really, really helpful. And so we're going to keep it alive and, and keep using it as we go through the course of the year. So we, we launched an ideas platform, uh, which is essentially a website where you can go on and either named or anonymously, if you wish, uh, which has led to some of the most interesting ideas. Um, you can post uh, something that you think our community should work on, should think about, uh, should take forward. And we've had everything we, we've had you know free membership for students so it must adopt plain english um you know nick talks too much uh we've had uh, including one that i know a couple of school libraries are going to take forward which is um creating an environmentalism section in the local public library and then letting local school children curate uh, the content so some really great ideas and would love to hear from your uh, community about um, you know things we could work on together, whether they're metadata or, or collections or, or knowledge. Uh, so please do go and have a look at sillipideas.org.uk um, and would love to hear from you. Uh, but really just thank you. I, I don't always feel we talk enough, although I, I'm really grateful to, to Sarah for the conversations in between times. As I say, the, the strategy will go live on the 9th would be fantastic uh, under new leadership if we can continue to build on, on this relationship and, and do more together. I know there are some slightly incomplete conversations, including one around accreditation that it would be great to pick up. Um, but just wanted to say a, a big thank you for making the time to join us uh, for this big conversation. And I hope it will continue post launch. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing and say uh, thank you very much. Sarah, did you want to close us out? Well, thank you very much. And thank you to everybody for your comments. Um, and if this is recorded, do we get the um, the comments in the chat? I suppose they'll be captured as well, won't they? Where um, we can um, pick up things. That I can hand over ideas to ideas generation to Lucy as well, so, or development anyway. Um, so um, thank you all very much indeed for your contributions. And thank you, um, Nick and Joe for taking the time to have a discussion with us today um, and for listening to some of our areas of concern in our specific area of the of the profession um, and thank you to Christine for organizing it and I'm so sorry I didn't include you in the introductions in the, earlier on <laughs> um, and um, that's probably the moment to um, to close this out isn't it thank you very much indeed very interesting conversation fantastic thank you all thanks everybody thank, thank you, you for having us thank, thank you, you. Bye. 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 Bye.